If we're going to simplify the radical, of course, when it comes to the square root of 81, we know that that is 9, because 9 squared is 81. When it comes to finding the fourth root of 81, we have a couple of different ways that we could go about it. First of all, you can think about that the fourth root of 81 has to equal some value. That value to the fourth power would have to equal 81. So you can guess and check and find out that if we took 3 to the fourth power, that'd be 3 times 3 is 9, and 3 times 3 is 9 again. When we multiply those, that would be 81. So that x, the fourth root of 81, has to be 3. The other thing you can do is actually calculate it and um, take 81 to the 1 fourth power. Doing that, your calculator will give you a value of 3. For the cube root of negative 125, I put a negative 1 in here to kind of mislead you and make you think that because that radicand is negative, um, there's going to be no solution. However, it has an odd index, so we're looking for some value for which x to the third is negative 125. And that can be negative as long as x starts out being negative. Uh, guessing and testing, we'll find out that uh, 5 to the third is 5 times 5 being 25 times another 5 is 125. So negative 5 to the third would be negative 125. That means cubed root of negative 125 must be negative 5. For those first three, they all simplified to be nice whole numbers. However, if you try to take the square root of 75, it doesn't work out. So what it means to simplify a radical is to uh, take out any perfect square factors. By that, we mean with square root of 75, we can look at 75 as 25 times 3. So when we take the square root of 25, that's 5, and the square root of 3 can't be simplified, so we leave that as square root of 3. Now, the uh, radical is simplified. Now, when it comes to a fraction, you can't have a radical in the denominator. So what we have to do, is, since we have square root of 5 in the denominator, I'm going to want to multiply this by another square root of 5. And whatever I do to the denominator, I have to do to the numerator as well. That way, I end up multiplying by a fraction that's equivalent to 1. When I multiply across the top, I'll get 1 times square root of 5 is square root of 5. But multiplying across the denominator, square root of 5 times square root of 5 is square root of 25, which is 5. Square root of 25 is 5, and now it's not a radical in the denominator anymore. Of course, don't take too big of a shortcut on this and think that all I have to do when I get to a cube root of 5 is multiply the numerator and denominator by the cube root of 5. If we do that in the denominator, we will end up with the cube root of 25, which isn't anything. I mean, it's, it's something, but it doesn't simplify very nicely. So that means that we have to rethink about what we're going to multiply by. We are going to have to multiply both numerator and denominator by a cubed root. But in order to cancel with the cubed root, I'm going to need a third power. Right now, I have 5 to the first power. In order to make it 5 to the third power, I would need two more 5s. So I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by 5 squared. That will give me, in the numerator, cubed root of 5 squared, which is 25. And in the denominator, we'll have the cubed root of 125. And, and of course, cubed root of 125 will simplify to 5. So no more radical in the denominator. Now it's moved up to the numerator. Similarly, when we have 1 over the cubed root of 25, it's important to think about that as 1 over the cubed root of 5 squared. Now I see that in order to get a perfect cube in the denominator, I only need one more 5. So when I multiply this, we'll have the cubed root of 5 in the numerator, and in the denominator will be cubed root of 125, which simplifies again to being 5.